there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain uh, how they moved, their trajectory. Uh, they, they did not have um, an easily explainable pattern. And so, you know, I, th I think that we're st uh, people still take seriously trying to investigate and figure out what that is. The truth is that we've never proved one, but there are things flying around up there that we haven't fully identified yet. And keep in mind, there are a, a basically a billion galaxies in an ever-expanding universe. I mean, you can't even get your mind around the sheer number of things that are out there. Noted. Uh, we're aware of the report requirement um, and our team at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence is of course actively working on that report um, and we take reports of incursions into our airspace by any aircraft identified or unidentified very seriously and investigate each one but uh, OD and I would be working on that report uh, and in terms of disclosure that would be uh, up to them. The report as you know is um, being uh, crafted and will be delivered by the Director of National Intelligence, but he has received a, a, a briefing on the work thus far. Um, and as we've said before, we take all incursions uh, into our operating spaces seriously. Um, uh, so, I mean, uh, like everybody else here at the, at, at the Defense Department, uh, uh, certainly we are taking the entire matter seriously as it, uh, uh, for uh, regarding the potential for, um, uh, for safety, for safety uh, concerns. Kid, Rafael Peralta's passability to launch Hilo ASAP. Keep going, bro. 
We're making sense. We could probably bring that 35 route. That's windy as fuck up on. Sir. Yeah, I'll bring it down. We got some, a lot of white water up there, so six foot swells. Whoa, it's getting close. <coughs> yeah, we have a uh, 31 knot sustained wind, <laughs> top side, gust of 40. What was splashed? splashed? Splashed. Mark bearing and range. If you can write a general that long where we're at, yes, and then that, the number of contacts you got, and get the course and speed meters off them. Yeah. You know what I mean? In relative position to us, the bearings might be helpful too. Eyes up. Eyes down. Yeah, down to maintain track, maintain track to question two. Track 781 just sped up to 46 knots, 50 knots, closing in. 38 knots. That, that one's pretty much perfectly zero, zero, zero relative, right? Yeah. 263, three miles, 55 knots, speed. What you have seen on the uh, TV recently on the Navy films, uh, I had known about this in my former capacity in Intel and the uh, Armed Services Committee. And I've talked to those pilots and they think it's real. Uh, so I have talked to Thomas, Dr. Z, about what specifically we could do from a science perspective, in addition to an intel perspective, to try to bring any additional light to this. Newscaster in every newspaper across the nation has made headlines out of it, and this afternoon we are honored indeed to have here in our studio this man, Kenneth Arnold, who we believe may be able to give us a first-hand account and give you the same on what happened. Kenneth, first of all, if you'll move up here to the microphone just a little closer, uh, we'll ask you uh, to just tell in your own fashion, as you told us last night in your hotel room and again this morning, uh, what you were doing there and how this entire thing started. Go ahead, Kenneth. Well, at about... Uh 2.15, I took off from Chehalis, Washington, en route to Yakima, and of course, every time that any of us fly over the country near Mount Rainier, we spend an hour or two in search of the marine plane that's never been found that they believe is in the snow someplace southwest of that particular area. I climbed back up to 9,200 feet, and I noticed to the left of me a chain which looked to me like the tail of a Chinese kite, uh, kind of weaving and going at a terrific speed across the face of Mount Rainier. Uh, I uh, thought I would clock them because it was such a clear day and uh, I didn't know where their destination was, but uh, due to the fact that I had Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams to clock them by, I just thought I'd see just how fast they were going since among pilots we argue about speed so much. And uh, uh, they seemed to flip and flash in the sun just like a mirror. And uh, in fact, I happened to be at an angle from the sun that seemed to hit the tops of these uh, peculiar looking things in such a way that it, it almost blinded you when you when you looked at, at them through your plexiglass windshield. And, well, I just kind of forgot it then until I got down at Pendleton, and I, I began looking at my map and taking measurements on it. And the best calculation I could figure out, now even in spite of error, would be around 1,200 miles an hour, because making the distance from Mount Lanier to Mount Adams in, we'll say, approximately two minutes, it's almost, uh, well, it would be around 25 miles per minute. Now, a line for air, we can give them three minutes or four minutes to make it, and uh, they're still going more than, than 800 miles an hour, and to my knowledge, there isn't anything that I read about outside of some of the German rockets that would go that fast. Well, folks, I've got some good news tonight for you. You don't have to worry anymore about those flying discs. I found out it was just Bing Crosby throwing away a lot of Sinatra records. <laughs> I can't understand why people scare so easily. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. 
All the Air Force officers reported that Wallace, the plane ship, had been found and been tested sometime last week. Captain Mantell, Flight Leader F-51, the Godman Tower. Over. Stand by for further instructions. Look to the flight into the area of the unknown. Stand the power to Captain Mantell. Investigate an unidentified object in your area. Mantell to Tower. I see it. Above and ahead of me. I'm still climbing. Mantel to tower. The object is directly ahead of and above me. Now moving at half my speed. Gunman Tower to leader, flight 451. Gunman Tower to leader, flight 451. Come in. Mantel to tower. It appears to be a metallic object of tremendous size. The object now was in visual view of the tower personnel. Mantel to tower. I'm trying to close in for a better look. I'll go to 20,000 feet. Shortly after this, Pilot Hammond, the remaining wingman with Mantell, called Mantell over his radio. Level off, Captain, until I've regained visual contact. The personnel in Godman Tower waited tensely for Mantell's reply, but he made no answer. A moment later, Pilot Hammond made another report to the tower. Mantell seemed to have disappeared. Mantell had apparently climbed beyond his wingman. At 1525, the remaining wingman broke off and returned to Stanford Field. The object, which was in visual sight from the tower, as were the F-51s during the chase, disappeared at approximately 1550. The F-51s were first lost to view, and then the object went behind a cloud. Godwin Tower to Captain Mantell. Come in, over. This is Godwin Tower to Captain Mantell. Come in, over. At 17.50, Staniford advised Godman Tower that Mantell had crashed five miles southwest of Franklin, Kentucky. The new code name for the UFO investigative project was Blue Book. The general appointed Captain Edward J. Ruppelt of ATIC at Wright-Patterson as officer in charge of Project Blue Book. Washington, ghost-like objects dart across the radar screen at the CAA Traffic Control Center at National Airport for several hours, traveling more than 100 miles an hour. Air Force jet fighters spend several hours chasing the objects plotted on the radar scope. General Sanford, Air Force Intelligence Director, confirms that the objects are not secret American weapons and reiterates the Air Force's obligation to investigate. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. Our basic difficulty in dealing with these is that there is no measurement of them that makes it possible for us to put them in any pattern that would be profitable for a deliberate, uh, custom sort of analysis to take the next step. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage. And that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. Major Keyhole, as author of the book Flying Saucers Are Real, what is your opinion of these new sightings of unidentified objects? With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots 
have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. It's uh, not, a, not a brief story, but it goes back to 1953 when a CIA-involved investigation was held. Uh, as a result of the extremely heavy wave of sightings in 1952, the CIA and Air Force became so concerned over the sheer number of uh, uh, reports that were tying up Air American intelligence channels that they wanted to get this signal out of the system, asked the Air Force, the CIA asked the Air Force for a, a debunking policy. The literal wording was to debunk the flying saucers, to decrease public interest in the UFOs. Uh, the panel members were seated around this table. It was a rather somber and impressive occasion, actually. I was a junior member, and I remember feeling considerably nervous and apprehensive about being in front of this powerhouse of scientists. But then for the past four years, I had been scientific advisor to the U.S. Air Force on this very problem. There were two films that were, were of particular interest to the panel at that time. One was a film taken by a Navy officer while on vacation in Utah, near Tremonton, Utah. And the other was a film taken in Great Falls, Montana, by the owner of the local baseball team. The Utah film had already been subjected to some thousand or so man hours of analysis by the Navy's Photographic Interpretation Laboratory. So the panel uh, got up in their chairs and crouched around the walls and examined the films, and they asked to have the films run several times, as a matter of fact. Now, the Navy had, on the basis of their detailed analysis of the Utah films, they had concluded that the objects shown on the films could not be birds, balloons, aircraft, and so forth, but indeed that they were self-luminous, unidentified objects. Despite this conclusion, the panel rejected it and concluded that the objects were birds. They couldn't be unidentified, therefore they had to be birds. I came away from the meeting and from the room with the distinct feeling, however, that the panel had deliberately moved to debunk the whole subject and not to give it the serious scientific attention which it deserved. Astronomer Carl Sagan is consultant to a current Air Force scientific panel. Astronomer Thornton Page was on a CIA committee that investigated UFO reports in 1952. Its conclusion? No evidence of UFOs. Our panel was expected to be, and I think was, uh, objective in its approach and tried to um, evaluate all the reports uh, without saying they're ridiculous in advance. That uh, has been repeated quite recently, uh, and that is a good reason for uh, talking with Carl Sagan here, because uh, he's in the same position that I was, being the only astronomer in a similar panel. Um, there's not a single uh, verified or checked out report which uh, is at all connectable with, uh, with the possibility of extraterrestrial life. It doesn't say that I, uh, I think extraterrestrial life uh, is impossible. Quite the contrary. I think that uh, many of the stars in the sky have planetary systems. We know enough now about the origin of life to uh, make it appear likely that uh, life arises naturally uh, on the vast bulk of these planets. Uh, it's possible, but by no means certain, that life uh, uh, on many of these planets evolves into beings which are uh, as advanced as we or more advanced. Uh, and I don't see any reason why we can't imagine that there are civilizations thousands or millions of years in advance of ourselves capable of technical feats that we, uh, we can hardly imagine. If you would believe, as, uh, as the flying saucer cultists would have us believe, 
that uh, the, the majority of the saucer reports are due to visitations, then you have a very strange situation. That means several spaceships are coming to the Earth over interstellar distances every day, as if all the anthropologists in the world were to converge on one of the, the Andaman Islands in the Indian Ocean uh, because they just invented the fishnet there or something. This is the Montana film, projected exactly as it was photographed. The objects are moving against a 25 to 28 mile an hour wind. This is the film in double frame or slow motion. A slight bounce in the movement of the objects as well as the tower is perceptible. This is due to the handheld camera. The film, analyzed frame by frame, shows the movement of the objects to be horizontal and steady. We will now vary the action and size of the objects and also stop the action from time to time for your study. We have just made a jump cut in the film to an enlarged size and reversed the action. You are now seeing the objects exactly as they were photographed, but from a closer perspective. Analysis reveals that the objects are not balloons, nor any kind of known aircraft. The images are very different from those produced by any kind of birds at any distance. The shape, brightness, speed, rectilinear path, steady motion, and separation rule out various forms of optical atmospheric mirages or cloud reflections. Comprehensive analysis has eliminated meteors and other known natural phenomena. The possibility of airplane reflection has been carefully studied and ruled out. This is the Utah film as it was originally photographed. The image structure and maneuvers definitely eliminate any kind of known aircraft. This is where Chief Photographer Newhouse, in his excitement, changed exposure. He believed that by changing density and giving the film more contrast, he could clarify the objects. The single object that reversed its course. The bounce is due to handheld camera. Now we study the action of one section of the film. We stop the action. We move in. Within a five mile range, aircraft could be determined. In excess of five miles, the speeds are greater than aircraft can achieve, except in straight line speed runs. The movement here follows an elliptical or circular pattern. 
Microscopic examination reveals that the objects are well focused. Their size varies from one sixth to one tenth the size of the moon as it appears to the naked eye. Their form is circular and sometimes elliptical. This fits the commonly used flying saucer description. Observe the object in the upper left corner. We move in to study the action. The object upper left will go out of frame on widescreen projection. Observe the motion of the two objects upper right as we rock them back and forth. Now we move over and up on the frame to make a closer study of the object in the upper left corner. Examine this object closely. Compare it with those objects you saw in the Montana film. These films were taken approximately two years apart, hundreds of miles apart. We drop back to the original perspective and resume. Now the section of the film where photographer Newhouse changed exposure. Weather conditions together with the persistence and motion of the formations eliminate the possibility of atmospheric mirages. Photogrammetric experiments have shown that the images cannot be associated with any kind of birds at any distance. Stop. Now forward again. Stop. We drop back to original perspective. Now once again and for the last time, the Utah film. The objects cannot be associated with any known balloon observations. For the last time, the Montana film. Now, to explain what what is what are we seeing and why are we seeing it in this uh, this particular. Okay, shade. so we'll just kind of go around. So if you look at the uh, don't uh, OPRs operate on the top left corner. NAR is narrow field of view, which is zoomed in. Uh, IR at the top middle, it means it's an infrared mode. So instead of seeing color, you're seeing temperature variations. Okay. And these things are extremely sensitive to in like tenths of degrees, they will tell you the difference due to color. So it'll go from black to white. So in this case, white is hot. So if you look down on the bottom left corner, it says WHT. Um, mm -hmm. That's white. It means white is hot. So the object that you're looking at is hotter than the sky around it. But what you also notice is there's no plumes. Now, if you're looking at an airplane, when you get closer, you'll actually see the exhaust coming out, and there will be a, a really glowing plume. That's important as, as we look at the video. And then the, most of the stuff on here you really don't need to know. What you can look at is uh, the bottom right corner, it says 19,990 and a B. That's the altitude. And uh, if you look up in the little words where it says HDG and then BALT, B, it's autopilot. So it's on altitude hold. It's just flying uh, for that. So you can go ahead and play the video. And so those two bars next to the white object, that's a, that's, a, that's a passive track. So what he's done is he's commanded the FLIR to track that. So what the system does is it uses uh, – it's actually tracking. It can track pixels, and it's just basically blocked those hot pixels, those white pixels from the black ones. And then you're going to see now – pause it real quick. So over the top, see, it went to a white screen with a black object. This is a black and white TV mode. And if you look at the top, it says TV. So narrow in TV mode is actually – you can get closer than narrow in IR. It, it's literally narrow in IR is about medium in TV mode. So there's, you can get closer with the TV mode. So as you look at it now, in this case, you would actually start to see um, stuff going on. And even in TV mode, because you get exhaust, you know, the black exhaust that comes out, you'll usually be able to see kind of some of that coming out of the back and you don't see anything. This thing's just sitting there. And if you look at the, uh, the top where it says three right, that's the pod is looking three degrees right of the nose of the airplane, right? So he's just flying along the bottom numbers. Don't worry, those are time. So it's 4156. So go ahead and hit play. And what, what he's doing is he's going, Chad's going through all the different modes because he's like, oh, I got it. And he's going to try and see the best video that he can get. Now, there's rumors that this video is like 10 minutes long. No, what you're looking at is the entire video. Now, 
Notice where it says 99.9? Mm-hmm. So hit pause real quick. What that means is the why he's got the pod, the targeting pod, because that's his primary sensor right now. The radar is still trying to look at this object and trying to range it, and the radar can't get ranging on it. So the object is doing something to say, I'm not giving you back, because it's just a Doppler radar, just like a police radar is a Doppler. It's trying to get a ranging on you, and it can't do it. So when it says 99.9, it, the radar cannot see this object right now. Hmm. It's not allowing it to get ranged. Because everyone thinks stealth is invisible. It's not. It's it's just it's a technology to to basically make it harder for radars to see you. You know, and that's the whole thing. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, airplanes that are nose on uh, are harder to see than airplanes at the side. It's kind of like think of a barn door. If you're looking at the whole barn door, it's really mm-hmm. easy to see. If I turn the barn door sideways where it's really thin, it's going to be a lot harder for you to see it. Got it. So that's, just, that's the easiest, most basic way to look at this. So keep going. You can play again. And you can look, the, the airplane is still sitting at 20,000 feet. It's doing 250 knots. He's going to go through different modes and try and lock it. And uh, it's just kind of sitting. And all of a sudden, as the video goes on, I think it's a minute and a half long. See, it's going to try and reacquire. It recenters the pod. So it's, it's slowly drifting to the left. The, the, the Hornet is still going the same heading, it's just kind of hanging out. And they're just filming this thing. And then when they get close, it's going to zing off the left-hand side. When you see it on a full, because this, you know, you think digital, you'd be able to get a one-for-one copy. Unlike, you know, when you copy your album to a cassette, you know, you lose a little quality. Well, you still do in digital world. And they're, yeah. off it goes to the left. And that's pretty fast to leave that field of view. On the, when we, we have big monitors that we look at these when they come back. So we're looking at the original tapes. So Play the end of that again, please, Jamie. So when it's taking off, how fast, when, when it just sort of like leaves the field of view and takes off to the left, how fast is that going? Uh, I would say pretty fast. It's an estimate. If we had ranging, you know, you could obviously do the triangle and go, hey, because we mm-hmm. know how big the field of view is. But for something to leave the field of view that fast with the pod just staring is pretty fast. I mean, it, it just, it's like out of here. Like nothing that we have? No, because we can't, I don't care what airplane is. So let's just use the F-22 Raptor. That's probably one of the, it's, it's probably the best airplane in the world right now, performance-wise. Um, it can't take off like that.